Mr. John Trinke, he's from Greenwood, Indiana, and uh, he is uh, going to be talking to us, a 50-minute message, Lord willing, on the critical problems, many in biblical scholarship, I mean many in biblical scholarship, but none in God's holy word. Brother Trinke, you're going to have a little drinky before you... Sure. Trinke, oh. <laughs> 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 All right. We welcome you from Greenwood, Indiana. Thank you. We, we need a little levity after sitting for so long, is that right? <laughs> All right, go right ahead. Okay, and, great. Uh, Lord bless you as you uh, I do have some uh, uh, copies of the paper on which I'm basing this. Uh, you want to pass them out? That, uh, we'll pass them out after. Absolutely. Right. They're, they're not stapled. It's in booklet form. And uh, so you'll have to find the staples. I didn't have the uh, time to, uh, to find that type of uh, formatting tools. But anyway, uh, it's a blessing whenever I'm at uh, Dean Bergen Society meetings because I go away so fired up uh, for defense of the traditional texts the original languages and the uh, defense of the King James Bible uh, I present this with a little bit of fear and trepidation because I name names that uh, of institutions that are very familiar to all of us I'm sure and I name uh, people particularly one person that I'm going to address uh, his views on textualism and that would be uh, Samuel Schneider of Bob Jones University uh, the, uh, the paper that I'm going to pass out involves uh, quite a bit of introduction and uh, it also covers under the evidences some about uh, D.A. Carson just a little bit just to kind of cover but uh, for the most part it's uh, the largest part of the paper is regarding uh, Mr. Schneider, Dr. Schneider, and his views. I want to give a little bit of a basis for where I stand, and I have to go all the way back to my childhood, because as I see these things and address them, I don't address them from a point of maybe as a foundation that I gathered around myself in the last few years or several years it started in my childhood and uh, I thank the Lord for his guidance uh, over the years of my life who graciously by his wonderful grace has kept me from some of the errors what I feel are errors that I've seen uh, in Christianity over the years and uh, I most of all thank the Lord for utilizing many people in my life to come to the positions that I've come to. And I say that with respect to the responsibility that each of us has as a Christian to be an example to others, and we never know how we are going to affect others way on in their life. Uh, the, uh, the text verse, I guess, would be uh, 2 Corinthians 5, and verse 18 and 19 uh, down through 20 but basically uh, all things are of God in verse 18 who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God and I believe that the Christian has the duty to not only reconcile the lost people to God, but to reconcile saved people who are an error to God. Okay? And that's what I think that the largest part of the Dean Bergen Society, we're not ministering mainly to the lost, we're ministering to the, uh, to a lot to the saved, uh, who maybe we believe are holding wrong positions. But I, I've got a list of people here, and, and I'll give you this list just to emphasize the point. Uh, I thank the Lord for parents who 
uh, went to church with me. Uh, you know, where I trusted Christ at a young age. And this was in a Missouri Synod Lutheran church. Uh, which taught me that the Bible is God's word and that every word is true whether I understand it or not. See, there was the foundation of my faith in what we call God's word. It didn't start in a fundamental Baptist church or, or a, a Bible brethren church uh, or you know a, a, a church as we think of normally as, as a sound uh, Biblicist church. But uh, I won't go into the history of the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church, but the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church basically began as a church, as, as a group of Germans who came over, persecuted from Germany by the state church in Germany, and they came over here to a large extent so that they could preserve their faith. And so uh, they did some things to keep a diligent watch on their doctrines and on their faith. And of course, I no longer agree with them in, in several areas of doctrine. But that's what they taught me. The Bible is God's word. Whether I understand it or not, it's true. I also praise the Lord for Dr. Everett Hunt, pastor of Lakes Pond Baptist Church, where I became a Baptist by conviction. And uh, he uh, preached many sermonettes along with his sermons and diligently taught doctrine. Uh, at every turn, he taught doctrine uh, and practical living, which you can't really separate from doctrine. Uh, Dr. B. Myron Cedarholm, I praise the Lord for him, uh, former president of Maranatha Baptist Bible College, for his position on the text in the King James Bible, and Dr. Hollywood. Uh, the first time that I met Dr. Cedarholm, Dr. Hollywood was there at dinner. It was in uh, very early January 1979 and we, uh, Watertown, Wisconsin had a severe snowstorm and I was invited to, to dine with them in, in, in the President's dining room and I had read on the, on the plane from Connecticut where I lived at the time I was reading a, a copy of The Sword of the Lord which had an article on the, the uh, textual issue and of course they weren't holding very good position on that uh, and uh, Dr. Cedarholm, Dr. Hollywood let me know that and I kind of suspected that I kind of questioned some of the things that were in it but uh, Dr. Uh, Cedarholm uh, held a tremendous position on the King James Bible and the TR and Dr. Hollywood guided the uh, uh, Dean Bergen uh, chapter that was there at the college and then I thank the Lord for Dr. Waite who came to Maranatha about that time that, I, that we got there uh, in 1979 uh, and uh, uh, started doing some reading and so forth regarding that issue and uh, Dr. Tom Strauss also for his position in that area and, and then uh, Dr. Clinton Brainine uh, who was my pastor for several years in Indianapolis, Indiana, Greenwood area and uh, who uh, for his position on the TR and in the King James Bible while president of Indiana Baptist College. That was, that's what transferred me to Indiana Baptist College was their position on the text in the King James. Because when Dr. Cedarholm left Maranatha, uh, Dr. Weniger did not hold the same position and I knew that I did not belong there at that time. And then for uh, Dr. Russell Dennis and his continued stand uh, for sound bibliology at Heritage Baptist University and uh, also for hosting the DBS last year in Indianapolis which is a blessing just to go about a block away and attend all the meetings uh, but the basis of all these testimonies is that biblical textual scholarship must be predicated upon faith in what is in the scriptures yeah. and that is where uh, our textualism and the textualism of the Horton Westcott crowd depart. And this, uh, Dr. Samuel Schneider proves that by what he writes. Uh, he says, it'll be in page 21 uh, when you get your paper, it says, It is safe to say that the science of New Testament textual criticism has forced itself upon us. This is so because the discovery of so many manuscripts of the New Testament presents us hundreds of thousands of minor variations in the precise wording of its text. 
The result is a strong concern among God-fearing men as to the present condition of God's revelation as transmitted through the generations of men to our own day. So that's a fear statement. It says, oh, we better be careful. We might not have the word of God. Uh, and I respond, first of all, God-fearing men who accurately know that God has promised to preserve his word will not be concerned if there are millions and millions of minor or major variations in extant textual evidence. Because if God has accurately preserved his word in the churches throughout the millennia since Christ, then God-fearing men will pay no heed to any neo-textualist theories based on something dug out of the archives. Uh, this writer will declare that all false and faulty extant manuscripts were rejected by the churches because of the self-authentication uh, of the scripture, working in the hearts and minds of God's people by the power of God's Holy Spirit. As this brother this morning testified, that it was the Spirit of God who told him that the King James was a good Bible. Uh, the scripture says, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into how much truth? All truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. John 16, 13. Sadly, Schneider does not believe that God has, by God's power, preserved the New Testament. Uh, he says this, God supernaturally interfered with the normal human processes in the writers of Old and New Testaments to guarantee the accuracy of his message in syllabic detail. Uh, but, he says, with regard to preservation, however, no scripture explicitly declare, declares anything of this sort of guidance to apply to the manuscript copyists as far as the precise wording of the text is concerned. Uh, maybe I missed some verses in my Bible, but uh, uh, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. That's repeated in the exact same wording three times in the Gospels. <coughs> uh, and regardless if it talks about the copyists or not, God promises it's going to preserve. He just doesn't tell us exactly how. He doesn't give us the, the exact formula. He just promises it. Uh, regarding Schneider's statement uh, regarding uh, concerning God's lack of interest in preserving his word verbally Schneider takes the same position in this important area of bibliology as the deist takes in God being interested in preserving his creation the deist says that God made it but takes no particular interest in maintaining it right. Schneider says that God took special care of making a perfect revelation to man but allows man to preserve it through humanistic manipulation the analogy partially breaks down because the creation became corrupt through sin by God's allowance. God even promises the corruption of the creation uh, through sin. However, God promises the preservation of his holy word. And this is impossible except by God's intervention to preserve the deposit of his word. Uh, it is not uncommon for Orthodox theologians to note that it is God who has preserved the canon, as, as Ryrie re remarks. It is essential to remember that the Bible is self-authenticating, since its books were breathed out by God. In other words, the books were canonical the moment they were written. It was not necessary to wait until various councils could examine the book to determine if they were acceptable or not. Their canonicity was inherent within them, since they came from God. People and councils only recognized and acknowledged what is true because of the intrinsic inspiration of the books as they were written. No Bible book became canonical by action of some church council. Next, self-authentication must be coincident with preservation. Something that is not preserved cannot self-authenticate. <laughs> You can't self-authenticate something that doesn't, that isn't there, that you don't know is there. Uh, the scripture says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever, for all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass, but the grass withereth, and the flower thereof fadeth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. 
And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you, First Peter 1, verse 23 and 24. Jesus says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Matthew 5, 18. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Matthew 24, 35. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Isaiah 48. Uh, isn't it something that uh, when God talks about the indestructibility of his word in the same breath he talks about the the weakness of man and the creation in the same context uh, my conclusion is one may then reject all neotextualism that tampers with the preserved word of God received text of the Greek uh, King James translation of the English based on the very promises of God's word that no individual or corporate human agency has ever or will ever be in a position of authority to tamper with the true text of God's holy word as Hort Westcott or their modern neotextualist contemporaries have done by missing those marvelous truths Schneider declares that although God mercifully saved the original penman of scripture from error God did not preserve the words of scripture even though scripture itself attests to such uh, preservation Schneider says such promises that is from God's word of preservation in view of the wording variations can apply only to the message of God's word not to its precise wording that's what he says second as previously argued by me the error that God's revelation is in disarray and confusion leads to another grave error that of believing that God has only preserved his message read as concept thought idea read as uh, higher critical ideas of inspiration have succeeded in a practical sense in the minds of neotextualists in modern translations Schneider definitely believes that the revelation that God uh, was careful enough to give in a word by word form has been only partially preserved third the prior error leads naturally to the license to translate in concepts ideas thoughts rather than giving strict grammatical attention to every word in the original language this new orthodox style of translating must definitely come from the view of scripture preservation such as Schneider's message preservation and I, I name his view message preservation because that's exactly what he says uh, it also answers the question of why a teacher of inspiration and canonicity who is also from Bob Jones University spent no time defining the term verbal inspiration while going through a list in inspiration and canonicity of, of definitions concerning that study he just skimmed right over it I wondered why at the time but now I understand after I read Dr. Schneider's paper I first read his 200 page doctrinal thesis and uh, I had to give that back it was borrowed I had to do that for the class and I noted some problems in it and uh, I was too busy at the time I didn't think much about it but then my wife and daughter were going down to BJ and I said pick up a copy of Dr. Uh, Schneider's doctrinal thesis for me I want to study that thing and uh, they went down there and my wife ran into Dr. Schneider and he says well I don't know why that guy would want that paper <laughs> who would want to read the 200 page doctrinal dissertation on this stuff so, but he said uh, that uh, he had a synopsis of his views in the, uh, and this is where I get his quotes from, the Biblical Viewpoint, Focus on Revelation, published by Bob Jones University, and uh, uh, published by BJ. And so I was very happy to get that because it made his views very concise, very to the point, <laughs> and you could spot immediately what he was saying so it made my task of studying his views much easier uh, it has become obvious that the necessity for verbal inspiration is greatly downgraded if only the message is preserved for Christians to use in this age 
it certainly appears that the natural outcome of such errors must lead to the eventual denial of verbal inspiration. I believe that, that uh, you can say all day long that God verbally gave his word, but if it's not preserved, we don't have his word. Uh, and I believe that that's their position. So verbal inspiration uh, says that verbal inspiration is still held on to by those of the neotextual school that is definitely only a belief in form for the appearance of orthodoxy, not in substance. Fourth, the error of believing that God has not preserved his words in the New Testament throughout the church age leads to the error of eclectic textualism. This allows textualists to use any number of extant manuscripts with their multitudinous wording variations and mutilations and pick and choose for themselves what is the word of God. Their resultant efforts become the word of God in the New Testament according to Joe, neo-textualist, and the committee of neo-truth. The true textualist will work to maintain the true word of God in publication which has not been hidden in the archives for centuries. Subsequently, eclectic textualism leads to horrible license with translating as witnessed by the NIV and others. Fifth, another issue which manifests itself uh, is the appearance of orthodoxy. And this is one of the most subtle things <coughs> because uh, it's, uh, it's kind of getting down into <laughs> the nitty gritty of where I see these people coming from uh, maybe well-meaning people, but they're not operating above board in what they believe. Uh, they're not shouting to the world that, uh, hey, we don't believe that God's word is preserved, his words are preserved, as they say. Uh, I do some parenthetical, parenthetical presuppositions uh, to this Thing on the appearance of orthodoxy is realize that Schneider's view is a product of his education just as the neo-textualists who taught this writer inspiration and canonicity both men were products of the bibliological teaching of Stuart Custer's school of religion Bob Jones University and someone was Stuart Custer's teacher etc etc just as John MacArthur's heresies on the blood of Christ were first held by his teacher R.B. Thiem and so forth students often follow their teachers in wrong doctrine but this is a very important point. This does not, however, remove from each of these men the responsibility to be subject individually to the truths of God. And this is why I believe that my grounding as a young child, not under the most perfect Christian situation, was so important that I learned that the Bible is the Word of God. And whether I understood it or not, it is true because why I left the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod was because there were some in the Synod that began to teach that all of the words of God were not true uh, and I rejected that immediately as an adult uh, because of my grounding in the truth that the Spirit of God bore witness with my spirit that might sound subjective but that's Christianity uh, God is not in heaven trying to confuse mankind rather God is actively through the agency of his Holy Spirit trying to teach mankind God's truths if a man truly seeks God's truth at the prompting of God's Holy Spirit God will reveal the truth however if man teaches man that an untruth is truth then it is God by the agencies of God's word and the illumination of God's Holy Spirit that will reveal to man what is truth and what is untruth, especially in spiritual matters. This is, the historical facts reveal that man often ignores, rejects, is blind to, deaf to the teaching of God's Holy Spirit through God's Word. It is much easier to attain goals in an earthly sense if one flows with the tide. Therefore, it is never the easy way to defend the truth but peace with God is more important and comforting, comforting than a pseudo-peace with man. And uh, I've lived that a few times in my life. And I maintain uh, that uh, some of you have lived that. Brother Bennett especially is one of the more current examples that I can recall of standing for the truth, being persecuted for the truth, 
but he had to stick with the truth I believe because his conscience and the spirit of God uh, in him uh, gave witness that he must remain true to God and to maybe forsake earthly associations in order to stay true to God Continuing, uh, in the appearance of orthodoxy, it is instructive to notice that Schneider uses words and phraseology which can only endear him to the militant fundamentalist group in which he fellowships, outwardly at least. Uh, here are some examples. Strong concern among God-fearing men. Uh, and I'm interpreting his words now. He is really saying that God-fearing men think that God has not preserved God's verbally inspired word. See, strong concern. That the way he phrases that and the context in which he phrases it he's questioning he, it's a questioning statement uh, and then he says preservation of the authoritative message of God he is really saying that God has not chosen to preserve his words in his context that's what he is saying <clears throat> and then he says this should encourage fundamentalists to relax their concern <laughs> He's really saying to biblical fundamentalists that although the evidence the neotextualists are using has many depraved variances from God's preserved text, don't worry, be happy. Yeah. <laughs> Is that not true? Yeah. Now, to the primary argument of Schneider, which attempts to identify with militant orth orthodoxy in such a way that must truly endear Schneider to his mentors at BJU. He says, others rightly object to using some modern English versions because these versions are products of men who do not subscribe to the inerrancy and authority of the very revelation they are translating. I, I, I could tear that statement apart right there because, see, he doesn't believe he has an inerrant thing to work with to begin with. So how does he know it's inerrant? Because he doesn't believe, his, his basis is that we don't, we don't have, we don't know where the word of God is. This objection reflects a basic understanding, he says, this objection reflects a basic understanding of the real issue regarding modern versions, that of scriptural separation. Code word. Men of God, he says, are not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, 2 Corinthians 6.14, in any religious or moral association. Such unequal yokes would certainly include the use of the translations of scripture that unbelievers produce. Separation, then, is the real issue here. That is such a phony statement by, by the way the people that he has to associate with to take on the beliefs that he does, the Nidas and, and the Alans of this world who are blatant liberals, theologically. Uh... Many fundamentalists would read the preceding statement and conclude that Schneider must surely be the best fundamentalist credential, so it would be unnecessary to question Schneider's views on textualism and translations. Schneider, by that statement, has given the theopolitical password for his theopolitical group, separation. Well, I coined a phrase in this paper, theopolitics. Uh, the politics of theological organizations, which may be churches, which may be schools, uh, and and I use it in the context in the sense in which people associate with one another not on the basis of principle not on the basis of God's word but on the basis of, of uh, some other motivations uh, personal agenda or whatever Schneider is trying to avoid the scriptural evidence that points to the corruption of the New Testament text by the neotextualists. If Schneider believes that the English versions translated by men who do not hold to inerrancy and authority of God's word ought not to be used as he states, then which modern translation would be left to use? The names of the translation committee of the NASV is sealed by the Lachman Foundation. Can Schneider perhaps supply the names so one may check them out for orthodoxy? Maybe Schneider supplied the, has been supplied the secret list and can inform everyone that upon his authority he can recommend them all as good fundamentalists. <laughs> also, Schneider must remember that all translators with ties to liberal, neo-evangelical, neo-orthodox, neo-fundamentalist denominations or groups must be excluded if he subscribes to the position of scriptural separations of BJU. If Schneider really believes what he says concerning scriptural separation practice, it, Schneider will of necessity shun all modern translations 
it would be difficult to find many, if any, modern uh, version translator from a militant fundamental background, especially one who still held to the fundamental principles of God's word. It appears that he jumped in over his head in trying to prove the importance of the position of scriptural separation of the translators of an English version. Schneider had another, another agenda other than separation to launch as he made a statement on biblical separation. Schneider's main premise in his, this whole area of modern English versions is that what is important in translations is not the underlying Greek text, get that? But the qualifications of the translators. Here's what he says. He says the real issue is not the underlying Greek text of an English translation, but the underlying attitude towards God word, God's word by men who translated it. Fundamentalists must expend their energies exposing and separating from the ungodly rather than causing strife and division among their brethren. <laughs> well, let's protect myself along the way, okay? <laughs> uh, The, uh, although such a vehement statement for biblical separation should put Schneider in position of great influence with fundamentalist brethren at BJU, this type of criteria could lead to good men translating what they would refer to as the Bible from the Greek text of Satan. If the text does, isn't, import, isn't the important thing, but the translators, what a statement that is. According to Schneider's reasoning in that statement, the worst available text in the world could be used to translate as long as the right men did the translating. This writer is a strong, that is me, I'm a strong advocate for biblical separation and in no way would attempt to denigrate that great, that great Bible doctrine, but it is necessary to see that the textual and translational position of Schneider has little to do with biblical separation and much to do with the following a scripturally bankrupt, bankrupt method of textualism and subsequent translation. After assuring that the inquirer that the textual base of a translation of God's word is not a paramount consideration, the next area of Schneider's article would take one through one of those gymnastic exercises which theologians are disposed to take one through. Uh, Dr. Howell, I wasn't referring to your dissertation, but uh, I'll study the paper too. <laughs> there was, I, I was following along in the Greek text, there were some blessings. I definitely picked up some of it, it's great. Uh, now, if T, that is Schneider, took the time to consider all the doctrinal aberrations with the neo-textualists have wrought through their corrupt text, Schneider might change his mind. Was Schneider's God born as the corrupt neo-textualists affirm, John 1.18. Or as the true text declares, as Schneider's God, the eternal Son of God, who existed from eternity and became a man by choice, by the birth process. This is monogenes theos versus monogenes huios. Jesus was not the only begotten God. He was the only begotten Son. The only born son. He was not born a God. He was always a God from eternity past. Sixth, Schneider tries to commit to the doctrine of preservation, but he can only commit to that doctrine in a very limited fashion. Schneider comes up with the convoluted reasoning that the variants, because they have not been they have not substantially affected the message of God, prove the doctrine of preservation. Schneider states that this fact dramatically reinforces the doctrine of preservation. But I ask, if you don't know that you're dealing with the Word of God to begin with, how do you know what the doctrine is? And I mean, I could ask more, many more questions right there. <clears throat> After Schneider seemingly gives some credence to the doctrine of preservation, he then turns around and woefully, woefully qualifies it by... Schneider's following comments, it is ascertained that according to Schneider and other neo-textualists, neo it is man's duty to determine what is God's word and what is not God's word. He states, however, the variants also prove that the doctrine of preservation as a sole consideration is not sufficient for determining the precise wording of the autographic text. This determination of the precise wording must proceed from a careful examination and analysis of the various factors that combine to produce the alternative readings. This process leads to a relative certainty concerning the original text of the New Testament. 
According to the neo-textualists, it is only the brilliant mind of the natural man that can maintain the purity of God's holy word. Or perhaps they would admit that they are only relatively certain they have arrived at the autographs. They quickly cover themselves with the doctrine of relativism, which is a humanistic doctrine, not a biblical doctrine. As the liberal would state, no one can know for certain. Is this what potential preachers should be taught at a militantly fundamentalist institution of theology? No. Schneider continues, the key word here, he says, is relative. And he puts it in quotes. He says, differing researchers lay varying stresses on different factors involved in the production of variant readings. For this reading, scholars are not always agreed on the details of the text. I say Schneider qualifies his view on the doc of the doctrine of preservation with humanistic relativism as he should since he admittedly will not ascribe to the scriptural principle that if God promises preservation with no qualifications then it is incumbent for the Christian to believe in preservation with no qualifications. Schneider next reveals his supreme mentors in the area of textualism, Brooke Frost, Westcott, and Fenton John Anthony Hort. Westcott and Hort raised the science of such studies, that is textualism, to its acme. Maybe acne, but maybe not acne. Uh, hence, all New Testament textual research revolves around either their work or refinements of it. So, whenever one of these guys tells me, well, we're not working with the Hort and Westcott anymore, that's old. He admits that it's all Hort and Westcott. <laughs> Obviously, Schneider and the faculty at BJU still labor under the same unstable and changeable criteria, not believing that the God of heaven is able to fulfill his promise, that he alone is caring for the deposit of Holy Scripture, using faithful men to pass on what the church has had in use from the first century. Verbal preservation is certainly implicit, if not explicit, in Scripture. I believe it's pretty explicit. <clears throat> Seventh, uh, Schneider reveals that his appearance of sep separatism is really a veneer because a true biblical separatist would always give God's word the benefit of the doubt and not submit to the use of humanistic rationalism. Schneider reveals his humanistic foundation as he, ge as he gives praise to Wilbur Pickering for not using excessive scriptural presuppositions when commenting on New Testament textual issues. However, Schneider does accuse Pickering of having scriptural presuppositions as the foundation of his arguments. Oh, naughty Pickering, right? He uses the scripture as the foundation for his arguments. We can't do that, can we? Uh, he says, although Pickering has avoided an excessive reliance on theological presuppositions in his presentation, it is nevertheless clear that a theological presupposition essentially undergirds his entire purpose. How naughty but how biblical. I don't necessarily agree with Pickering on the totality of his work, but uh, if he wants to use scriptural, the scripture as an undergirding of what he believes, he has the right foundation anyway. Since when should a true Christian scholar not give God and his word the rightful place in all biblical studies? Amen. This goes back to the point in Horton Westcott uh, in the, in the uh, higher critical theory that you must uh, you cannot deal with the Bible uniquely than any other literature and here you have BJ dealing with the Bible like any other literature not dealing with it as a unique writing from God uh, and he's basically saying that if anyone uses the scripture as a basis for studying textualism they're wrong separated from the neo-textualists. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath, communion hath light with darkness? What conquered hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? And so forth. He, Wherefore come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord, touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. For Schneider to insist that Pickering relies on scripture too much shows that Schneider holds the views of the former German rationalists and their spiritual offspring.
mainspring, former and present day theological liberals. It is incumbent upon a Christian to operate by faith, believing God's revelation is plainly stated, even in the face of not being able to explain God's word through logic, philosophy, rationalism, human wisdom, etc. To the world, this position is foolish, quote, unscholarly. To the Christian, this position is faith. It may be necessary for the scholar of Christian higher education to rely heavily upon logic and rationalism in order to attain goals of recognition within his chosen field, but the results attained will not be in accord with the truth of God's word. The scribes and Pharisees at the time of Christ's sojourning on earth did not attain their lofty theological positions by being true to God's word, but they attained their positions by the opposite methods. These men were the acknowledged fundamental separatists of their day. It is this writer's observation that time has passed but nothing has changed and how spiritual corruption eventuates in orthodox theological circles. Number eight, Schneider shows a lack of understanding of theological history and methods Satan has used in the past to corrupt Christianity. He says, uh, there remains a conflict about historical and textual matters. This conflict is not between those who uphold the word of God and those oppose, who oppose it, although there may be some who would use textual research as a platform to oppose God words, God's word. Such a platform is too counterproductive to be a significant factor, factor in textual research. For an enemy of God to concern himself with textual research would be to acknowledge the importance and authority of God's word. So he says, there can't be any liberals in this field. Because the liberals wouldn't think the word of God was important enough to tamper with it. <laughs> Half God said. <laughs> uh, it is a naive view of history for Schneider to conclude that apostates and unbelievers would not involve themselves in the field of textual criticism. If Schneider simply backs up a little in time from the work of Horton Westcott, he could plainly, plainly see that some of their predecessors are prominent in the wily world of those who doubt the word of God. And I quote from Zane Hodges. He says, Horton Westcott are usually credited with dealing a death blow to the dominance of the TR, and this may be acknowledged. Their antecedents, uh, the antecedents of their thought, however, are worth noticing. They acknowledge a debt of, of the work of J.J. Griesbach, whose basic approach to classification of the evidence they revived. Griesbach was a pupil of J.S. Semler, sometimes called the father of German rationalism. The term recension to groups of New Testament witnesses, like the fathers and the lectionaries probably. Huh? Uh, it is ironical that its roots, that is the false theory of New Testament recensions, are to be found in the rationalistic soil where hostility to the authority of the Bible also flourished. Well, St. Hodges refutes Schneider on that point uh, to give somebody with better authority than I have, I guess, in that area of study. Schneider cannot be so ignorant of his own textual mentors as to be uninformed as to the rank heresy of the spiritual fathers of Horton Westcott in the area of textual criticism. A man known to be the father of German rationalism seems to be one of the chief architects for the corruption of the new uh, true New Testament Greek text, and Schneider claims that heretics do not get involved in the area of textual criticism. Unless Schneider can prove the orthodoxy of Horton Westcott, Griesbach, Semler, he has a duty to repent of such an informed, uninformed assertion. D.A. Waite has duly exposed Horton Westcott and their heresies. All of these men, at the very least, had the premise that God's word had been lost and corrupted for millennia, which proposition is scripturally bankrupt. An idea that is opposed to scripture truth is put forth by someone who cannot be described as anything but an enemy of God, at least in the area of the untruth put forth. It seems that Schneider's false assurance that theological liberals have no interest in textual criticism is given to keep the Bible-believing people off his back about his humanistic position on the providential preservation of God's New Testament text. He falsely assures the reader that heretics have actually have done actually very little concentrated tampering with the text of the New Testament. This knowledge ought to restrain fundamentalists from placing textual research in the same category as modernistic attacks on the veracity of God's infallible revelation. 
Schneider thinks that all the ironclad theories of the neotextualists exempt them and him from the same rigorous examination that all areas of Bible study are to be given by Christians. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 Prove all things. Dakabadzeta Test, examine, scrutinize, recognize as genuine <clears throat> the only way to answer Bible questions is with the Bible not with humanism a liquor salesman after recognizing the moral dilemma of his profession has an opportunity to remove himself from that moral dilemma a neotextual critic after recognizing that taking God's authority of preserving the scriptures into his own hands is not scriptural has an opportunity to cease criticizing God's word and start affirming the precious preserved word of God a recent writer has commented pertinently concerning God's preservation of the scriptures versus man's attempt to find the supposed lost and found scriptures of the neotextualist he states when a new that is a newly found scripture or manuscript of scripture is critically accepted the acceptance itself indicates that the new manuscript submits itself to criteria criteria based upon the reason of the critic this of course disqualifies the new find from being scripture in that its authority is derivative receiving its authentication from man and not intrinsic as is God's self attesting authentication of his word that's from uh, brother uh, Peter Van Cleek and I remember that message that he gave down in Louisville a few years ago. And Van Cleek concludes his paper with a sincere plea to Christian scholars that may it not be said that the day in which we lived was also the dark ages, as once again the authority of God's word fell to the critics and the simple faith of believing God's promise to preserve his word ridiculed as the faith of the blind.